Hello, and welcome to another edition in our video Q&A series with Quilt Achievement's Head of Charities, William Reid. Today we'll be discussing behavioural finance and its relevance to the charitable sector. Thanks for joining us, William. Thank you. So first of all, for the uninitiated, what is behavioural finance? Uh, well, behavioural finance, other than being fascinating, is really looking to apply sort of psychology to look in the way in which people actually make uh, financial decisions. Uh, now, it may come as a surprise that, you know, as opposed to financial theory, which says we all act in a rational um, a, a way, um, actually there's sort of fairly good uh, proof that actually we act in a fairly irrational way when it comes to uh, making financial decisions. There are sort of two key pillars within sort of behav behavioural economics and, and, and finance. The first is what we call mental accounting. Now this is a way in which that you may take the same sum of money and actually apply, if you like, a different value to it depending where it comes from. So, you know, you've got your salary that you get paid, uh, it may be that you've had a tax rebate, and it may be that you've won some money down at the bookies. And actually, in each case, you know, you may be looking at, say, a sum of £500. But actually, you may look and value the money that you get paid, £500, and see that's different from the money that you have got down at the bookies, that £500, and therefore have a different perception of how you're going to spend it and the value of it to you. Um, where I think that becomes relevant in a charity perspective is that you often see when people have got their investment reserves and they may, you know, we've got a, a million pounds here, and they may go, well, we've done a fundraising campaign and we've raised a million pounds over here. But they'll take a different view of the risk they're willing to take with a million pounds that they've raised fundraising versus maybe what they consider to be reserves of a million pounds over here. But arguably, it's all a million pounds, so why are you taking a different mm. risk or view on the monies you've got there? And that differs from, I guess, prospect theory, which again is really where behavioural um, finance uh, comes from. And there's, again, a multitude of, 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 of angles you can take here from loss aversion uh, to framing to overconfidence uh, and the like there too. So again, I mean, as an example, if you're looking at framing, you know, how is a question put to you may determine the answer you get. So mm -hmm. if I said to you, what's one times two times three times four times five times six times seven times eight, you might come out with a, Again, just literally off the top of your head, what would you? 48. I was hoping you weren't going to ask me that. Okay, 48. <laughs> okay. Uh, whereas conversely, if I said what's 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, any thoughts? I'm lost. Okay, well, it's the same. The, the, the subtle thing there, obviously, it's the same. same one, one, 1 to 8, so the outcome is going to be the same. What you tend to find is when you do 1 times 2 up to 8, the average answer people come out with is 512. When you do 8 down to 1, the average answer people come out with is 2,500. The actual answer is 40,320. So uh, you missed a little bit. I said 48,000. <laughs> well, there we are. There we are. You could close. Very close. But again, but it is this then this, and this is really, I guess, where uh, you know, the authorities are concerned because, again, the way in which I frame a proposition to you will maybe, you know, it's the same outcome, but actually the way it's put to you may lead to you make a different decision. Mm. So again, where that can come across for the charity is maybe, uh, again, beyond finance, say you've got your um, renewal for your uh, employment insurance or general insurance, uh, and maybe that's going to cost a, a thousand pounds. Um, but then again, it's a question of, I say to you, well, for just another hundred pounds, you know, you can have uh, legal cover, or I can say for 10% more, you can have legal cover. Actually, again, it's the same amount of money I'm charging, but if I ask you it as a percentage versus an actual figure, you may actually have a different answer because in your head one sounds bigger than the other mm. and one sounds like good value. Well, you mentioned the authorities taking an interest. Um, and how is this being used in practice by policymakers or regulators? Or? Well, I think I think it's at the early stages at the moment with the uh, so yeah, the, F the FCA Financial Conduct Authority who are taking an interest here. And I think really particularly in those specific areas of going, you know, how how do people react to the way in which things are, are put to them and. And I think we'll see that again in terms of picked up, um, uh, you know, in Europe, European legislation with you know the MIFID directive that we've seen coming out there, which looking at sort of obviously financial regulation as a whole. And there, where again, when they're looking to introduce uh, people reporting costs, they're going to have to do it as a percentage and as an actual physical sum mm -hmm. again, so that there's sort of no gaming, as it were, ar ar around the edges. Um, I think the other thing that you see, or you know, other areas that one finds uh, fascinating, again, like loss aversion. Um, and so uh, if I say, well, here's investment A and it's gone up 10% and here's investment B and it's gone down 10% uh, and at the end of the year I've got a new investment for you and I go, okay, you've got to sell one of those two investments for me to buy it. More often than not, you'll sell the one that's gone up 10%. But then the argument would be, why are you selling the one that's doing well? Why aren't you selling the one that's not performing for you? 
And it's actually because, I guess, the theory would suggest that actually there's a pain for you selling something where you've lost money, albeit, mm. if you like, that the relative uh, gain or loss in that situation is, is identical. Mm. Um, I think the other thing that trustees need to be aware of in terms of, say, overconfidence, um, and again, can you not need you to be carried away, but you may take more risk than actually perhaps maybe uh, you should be taking uh, because again you maybe believe your circumstances are better than they, they are you know so from an individual perspective you know, look at the whole question of pensions and people saving for pensions and going well actually that'll be fine I'm sure it'll you know come good at the end uh, maybe they should be putting some money away mm -hmm. um, and again as an aside a great one to try around the office um, I want to do it with Leonardo da Vinci uh, is go and ask people when was he born um, and just say I need a lower range and an upper range. It can be you know any time. You know, when when do you think he was born? Now I think 1452 is when he was actually born. But what you'll tend to find is those who are more overconfident will give you a narrower range. Mm -hmm. So again, you set no parameters. So someone could have said from 1 AD to yesterday, and they'd be right because that's when he was born, mm -hmm. somewhere between there. But people will probably give you you know 50 years, 100 years. And you go back and ask them, well, why did you do that? I didn't tell you to do that. And again, the narrower the range, probably the more overconfident they are. And again, it tends to be a trait which we're not born overconfident, but once you become overconfident, it's actually impossible to not be overconfident anymore. Mm. But and the ways uh, sort of chari tr trustees or charity managers can use these ideas and practice or uh, you know, apply them um, to, to, to be, have greater success in their day-to-day -day roles? Uh, well, I think it's I think it's really it's being aware, um, and so it can be everything from again in terms of herd mentality, uh, and so and again this is something you know as us as investment managers should be looking at. And you hear about contrarian investment, uh, you know, is is the time to be buying everything when it's just hit a new all-time high, or is the time to be buying when actually everyone thinks it's the end of the world? You know, the stock market's on its knees. Well, mm. again, history suggests the time to buy is when everyone is fearful. You know, that's when stocks tend to be cheaper. Uh, whereas actually everyone gets over carried away, you know, you go, well actually it should hit an all time high, I'm going to pile in here because I don't want to miss out. And then you have the problem again, a loss of version because when do you start selling when things fall, fall away? So it's having that awareness in the background for ourselves when we're making our investment decisions. But as I say, I think it's again, it's this whole sort of piece and just and being aware that actually if you like the human brain uh, whilst it, you know, we, we can look at uh, you know, the table and we, we know instantly that's a table, whereas if it was a computer, you know, we'd have to look through various images and we go, that's a table. But actually, in terms of our DNA, and again, this is where they've you know, gone back and uh, ex sort of experimented to prove, actually the human brain is flawed when it comes to making rational investment decisions. Thanks, William. You can read more about behavioural finance on charitytimes.com or in Charity Times magazine. Keep an eye out for further editions of our video Q&A series with Quilt Achievia where we talk about impact measurement, income generation and the measurement of the performance of investment assets. Thank you for watching.